Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8. I'm sure you've all been reading in Deuteronomy in the last few days. See, I have set the land before you. Go and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. Now, this is a message given to the Hebrew people. However, we must understand that we who are of faith, and it tells us this over in the New Covenant, that we who are of faith are of the seed of Abraham and heirs to the promise. So what God has instructed them to do not in every single case, but what he has instructed them to do, the church does not replace them in any way, but there are some things that we are to do under the new covenant that parallels what they were to do under the old covenant. And they were told to possess the land. To possess the land. Now, Part of the word possess, if you look it up in the dictionary or wherever, means to occupy or to inherit. And this word about possessing is used over 250 times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word. And so it's something that God over and over and over told his people that they were to possess what he has given them. Now, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible has a little note in the side in the New King James Version. That a, a dear friend of mine was the editor of that. It says that this word possess refers to an everlasting possession. Not just a temporary possession, but an everlasting possession. And so, I want to ask you this question this morning. What is it that God has given you to possess? What, what has he told you to possess? Now, you can possess property, but it's more than that. You can possess money, but it's more than that. And even within the word possess, possess and occupy, even though they are similar, there's a distinct difference. Because you can possess something and not occupy it. I mean, at this very moment, there, there's a house that I own, but I don't occupy it. I possess it, but I don't occupy it. Now, what God is telling the church, that what he has given us to possess, we must also occupy. In other words, you need to hold on to and use what it is that God has given you. Many of you have received talents from God that you possess, but you're not using them. They're not being occupied by you. And these talents, God would have not given them to you to use for the world, although there are times when God will use your talent in the world to prepare you, develop you to use that talent within his kingdom. There are many people who have started out in one area of life, have been trained in techniques of the world, and then they've been able to move over into God's kingdom and develop those techniques 
for their use in God's kingdom. Now, don't take that out of context. That doesn't mean that you can go down to the strip joint and be the accountant at the strip joint so that God can use you working in the church. I did have a man come forward one time. And he said, I think that God has called me to go to girls, girls, girls on the other side of the lake and um, witness to the women there. I said, well, why? He said, well, they need Jesus. They, you know, girls, girls, girls. I, it's, at Christmas time, it was, you know, it was called ho, ho, ho. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> so he says, I want to go over there and witness to the girls. And I said, well, does your wife know about this? She's sitting back there. I said, does your wife know about it? He says, no, it just came on me right now. I said, well, why don't we bring your wife up here and let's just get her in this discussion. Oh, no, no, just between you and me, preacher. You know, God's not going to call you to sin in order to train you to witness. Okay. And I just suspect he probably wanted to go over there and be real spiritual and have a laying on of hand service or something. But, but you know, God does give us talents that we can develop. But what is it that God's given you? You know, God didn't give you a talent to be wasted. He gave you a talent to be used in his kingdom. Wow. So you can possess something, but you need to occupy it at the same time. You know, it's interesting in Luke 18, 12, there's just a a quote, and it says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And you can do that. You can actually tithe off something you possess. But God's wanting you to just more than have money. He's wanting you to possess and control that money for him. You know, my, my mother, bless her heart, she's 94 years old. She'll be... 95 and just a little bit and uh, when, when I was young she used to tell me as I'd go out the door Larry just remember <coughs> Jesus is with you and I, I thought well I better not go where I was going then because I don't think I want to take Jesus there you know and we need to understand this that you are the church And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And where you go, God goes. And I know this may sound a little weird, but what you see, He sees. What you touch, He touches. What you speak, He may not be using the words, but I'll tell you what, you're representing Him. People know that you're a believer. I talked with a man on the phone, a businessman this week, and I was going to hire him for something. And he probably spoke for about five or six minutes. And I think there were probably 10 or 15 words he used that were not curse words. That was more humor. Okay, but, but it was true. I mean, he, he used foul language. He even used words I don't know if I've heard them before. Your words will mark you and they will... Your words will declare what's in your heart. And other people's lives, now think about this, other people's lives will be changed one way or the other based upon the words that come out of your mouth. And I'm not just talking about your children or your your spouse. People you work with. People at the grocery store. And even the people that wear pajamas at Walmart, I'm telling you, everybody is influenced in one way or the other by what you say. You represent Jesus. He is in you. And and you need, you not only possess a body, you need to occupy your body. Your body is a representation of the Holy Spirit. 
The scripture says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And he lives inside of you? How about letting him possess you? Some people are possessed, but we need to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. And then let him guide us on how to walk and occupy our lives. Hmm. Well, if you're going to uh, occupy some place, you got to start with yourself. You know, years ago, years ago, uh, I was at a conference, and I was talking with a man, and I didn't realize that he was the publisher of a major national magazine for our, for our industry. And he said, what is your take on sales? And I said, well, I, I think, and what, what happened was, is he took what I told him and made a, a major article in this magazine, <laughs> and on the front cover of the magazine, they had me, I know they photoshopped it, I was in a Superman suit, you know, with the little blue legs and whatever, and the cape, and kind of looked like Sheldon there, and... Uh, but here's what I told him here, that he, he ran with. When someone walks through the doors of your business, the first thing that you do, forget your product, forget your business, forget it, everything. Get them to like you. Get them to feel comfortable with you. Get them to respect and believe you. And you don't just get in their face. I mean, sometimes it'll take a few visits to your store before that happens, before they actually feel that way. But you need to build, build up confidence with them in you. And then, after a period of time, you talk about your business. Oh, you know, this is a family business. We what? And you just spin the story, whatever it is. Yeah, we started 40-some years ago. My dad started this. And, and, and get them to respect your business. Take them around. Show them the different employees. And, and, and everybody's got a smile on their face. And, and next thing you know, they like you. And they really like your business. And then the last thing that you show them is your product. And by that time, they don't care what you sell. They're going to get it from you. They may have been a Ford man all their life, but if you're at the Chevy dealership and they like you and they like the dealership, they're going to look at each other and say, you know, I know we always want to get a Ford. Grandpa had a Ford. His daddy before him had a Ford. But you know what? I want these people to take care of my car. I, I like this business. Let's just, let's just do business here. And so what happens is, is if you can get them to like you and like your business, then you can sell them anything. So that was my philosophy. And so one day the Lord was speaking to me and he said, you know, a lot of people in the church are going about this thing backwards. The first thing they do is they go get into people's face and try to sell them Jesus. Now, now don't, don't take this wrong because that's kind of what you're doing in a way. And there's times when you're led by the Holy Spirit, you may need to get into somebody's face. But just generally speaking, some people are Christians because you are and they like you. And some people are not Christians because of the way you act and you represent Jesus. And they go, if those people are Christians, I don't want to have anything to do with this. You need to possess your own body, your own life. You need to live a life that will make people want what you have. Because if they don't, if they don't like you and they don't like your surroundings, then they, why in the world would, would they want to be a Christian? I mean, it's kind of like when the youth leader calls everybody together and he says, go out and tell all the other kids they can have what you have. And half the kids there didn't even want what they had. You know, why would anybody else want it? No, look, you say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the life I'm living. You don't know the, you don't know the circumstances of my 
household. If you had to live here, you would be a gripey person too. You'd have a bad attitude when you went to the office or went to work. If, if you were going through what I'm going through, well, let me just tell you, consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And you know what? I want to give you a scripture here in a few moments that will set you free if you can believe it. Wow. So, we are a three-part being. Angie, put up this graphic. All right. Which, by the way, Angie made this graphic. She is a very graphic person. Okay. According to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, which is your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions. And it's contained in a body. When you get saved, it is your spirit man that gets saved. But Jesus made this comment. He said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Well, where's the heart there? It's not your spirit, your soul, or your body. Your heart's something else. Well, somebody may say, well, your heart is your spirit. Well, no, because listen, if your heart was your spirit, and out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks, that means you would never say anything. Your spirit's been made perfect. You would never say anything wrong. But how many of you have said something wrong? And for the rest of you, liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay. So what is your heart? Your heart is the, the, the you. It's, it's, everything speaks to your heart. Your spirit is speaking to your heart. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, and emotions. Now within the spirit is the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking to you. He's that still small voice, although sometimes he yells at you and you still don't listen. Okay? But the Holy Spirit is within your spirit, and he's speaking to you. And he's speaking to your heart. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, and emotions. It's what you hear. It's what you see. And what you see and what you hear gets into your heart. What are you watching? Are you into pornography? You know, surveys tell us that one-third of the Internet is pornography. Are you into that? Is that what you watch? Is that what you're feeding from your soul into your heart? What, what are you listening to? You know, the guy that, that cussed 99 words out of 100. I don't need to listen to that. If I'm going to do business with somebody, I don't need to listen to that. So I got somebody else. What, what are you, who are you surrounding yourself with? Now, now look, you're in the world and you're going to you're going to have people that are not Christians. That's true. Jesus said in John 17 that we're in the world, and he doesn't want to take us out of the world. He wants us to be in the world. Why? That's because where the lost people are, they're in the world. But we're not of the world. And so you can have people that you know and that you communicate with, but you have an inner circle. There are people, and usually it's a very small inner circle. You know, usually you can count them on one, one hand. Which, unless you're a Nephilim, that's, that's five fingers. Four fingers and a thumb. Okay. So, who's in your inner circle? Who do you allow to speak into your life? Do you go down to the, uh, uh, Joe's Pub and Grub and sit there and drink a beer, and, and whoever comes along, you start telling them your woes and, and listening to somebody that has... <laughs> they're, they're, just, they're just there getting drunk too. Who, who do you allow to speak into your life? Hmm. And then your body. What are you doing to your body? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't feel good? Well, sometimes you don't feel good because you have had an attack, an unwarranted attack by the enemy. Sometimes you don't feel good because you've just had two gallons of ice cream and a full chocolate cake. What are you doing to yourself? 
Are you possessing your own body? Are you possessing your own soul? Your spirit is already possessed. But what are you putting into your heart? Because out of the abundance of your heart is what you're going to say. I guarantee you, you hang around people, you hang around, bring them to your inner circle. Now, I'm not saying you don't know them. I'm just saying you bring them into your inner circle and they're just using foul language right and left. You know what's going to happen? Somebody cuts you off in traffic and those words are going to come up out of the abundance of your heart. You're going to be really tempted to say that word that you don't say. Why? Because that's what you've put in your heart. You need to possess yourself. Hmm. Luke 21.16 You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. In other words, keep your mind aligned with the Word of God. Hmm. The word occupy means to fill up, to dwell, to reside, to hold firm, hmm. to seize possession and maintain control as if you had just won a war. You need to take control of yourself. Do we want to win the world? You're not going to win somebody else until you can take care of yourself. How do you expect to influence anybody else that's a mess when you're a mess? Hmm. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you get yourself in order, you're glorifying God. When you are a mess, now look, I'm not talking about an attack. You can have an attack and you can be down, you can have an attack in your body. You can even be having an emotional attack. There's different types of attacks. But there's a difference between an attack from the outside and something you're just doing to yourself. And there's a lot of people that are just doing it to themselves. And you need to learn how to possess and occupy the body that God has given you and the mind that God... You need to take control of your mouth and there's things that you know you shouldn't say. And what's just as bad as cursing, gossip, lying... Prideful words. Hmm. Wow. So, parents, occupy your family. Okay, now, don't lord it over your family. Yeah. One day I, many, many years ago, I preached a sermon on how Men, I was talking to the men. I said, you need to take care, control of your household and not let evil come in. You need to be the gatekeeper. You need to, you need to stop certain things from coming in your house. You're talking about your kid getting drunk in the house? Well, how's the beer getting in the house? It's your house. Don't let it in. Don't let the liquor in the house. Just be the gatekeeper. So later that afternoon, I got a call from the guy's wife. And she said, he's sitting in the lazy boy and will not get the remote. He's making the kids go get the remote. 
And then he's telling them what channels to turn to. He's lording it over his house. That's not what I'm talking about. And once again, that was supposed to be humor also. <laughs> but but, but, but you've got to watch how you hear these messages. And be led by the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the things that Robbie always said was the solution to every problem. He said, be led by the Holy Spirit and walk in love. And when you're witnessing to other people, and I know this may not sound right, but you have to sell your, yourself first. If somebody's irritated at you, they're not going to listen to you. If you are a mean, gripey person, then all of a sudden you decide to get your Bible and smile and try to win them to Jesus, they can see right through that. Why do you think in situational comedies on television, when, when the two missionaries come to the door, knock on the door, and people open the door, they go, oh, brother. It's because there's been a precedent set. And when Jesus sent them out, he didn't send them out for them to be pushy. He talked about how to dwell with people. Well, you dwell with somebody, you're polite. Okay, occupy your family. Occupy your spiritual life. It's okay to watch a television program. It's okay to go to a movie of something that you like. But don't do that to the total exclusion of getting into the Word of God. You, you need to have a balance in your life. You know, in the same way physically you are what you eat, spiritually it's the same way. You are what you eat. And then Jesus told us, occupy the earth until he comes. Now, here's my, I wish Kim was up here. I'd have her do a big drum roll. Okay, everybody, we're getting down to the, this, this, is the, this is a big deal. It's a big deal. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. That's enough. <laughs> Here's, when I've shared this with people over the years, one of the things I hear, and it, it, it sounds like who would say this, but think about this. They say, but I can't. Because you just don't know what's going on in my life. If you had going on in your life what I've got going on in my life, you wouldn't be Mr. Happy. You, you wouldn't be so joyful. Because I'm going through an attack. I'm going through a trial. I'm going through a great temptation to just Get a gun and shoot a few people. I'm, 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 I'm right at the edge. And I, you, you may not think that that's a common answer, but that's the kind of answer. I'm summing it up and maybe exaggerating just a little bit, but that is the kind of answer I get when I tell people, you just need to do it. Well, there's a scripture, and here's the scripture. It is... Well, it goes on to two pages, but it's just a short scripture. Listen to this. Now, don't put this up on the overheads yet. I want to read it to them. Now, listen to this. No temptation. Now, that word for temptation in the New Testament is also trial or burden or test. Now, now listen to this. No trial, no temptation, no test. And, and one guy, just a few weeks ago, he told me, he said, you have no idea how, how that temptation comes upon me. Because he'd been doing something that he shouldn't be doing. And he says every time he tries to quit, that temptation just comes upon him. And he can't resist that temptation. Well, here's what the scripture says. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. In other words, don't think that what you're going through, that you're the only person going through it. There's a lot of people going through 
what you're going through, whether you think they're going through it or not. Okay? No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted, tested, or have a trial beyond what you are able. And that, the implication there is what you are able to withstand. But with the trial, with the temptation, with this attack, he will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Wow. Now put the scripture up, Angie. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So, here's what you need to understand, know, and believe. And the enemy does not want you to know this. This is... This scripture is a secret that the enemy wants to keep from you because way too many Christians get in situations where they say, I just can't take it anymore, and they cave. Listen, whatever comes against you, hurricanes have different levels. Grace is God's power that he gives to you. Whatever the attack is, whatever the hurricane level is that comes at you, if it's a level four hurricane, God will give you level five grace. If it ends up being a level seven hurricane, he'll give you level eight grace. With every attack, no matter what it is, he will make a way for your escape so that you will be able to bear it. And when you say, I just can't take this anymore, or I just can't handle this, what you're doing is you're saying the thing that the enemy wants you to say because God has says, you can do it. Now, in other places, he words it a different way. One place he says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. All things? Yeah. You can weather the storm. You can weather the attack. And my closing thought. Here's my, come on, do better than that. Come on. Yeah, okay. Here, here's my closing thought. There may be reasons why you would give up. But there's no excuse. And a lot of times people lean on the reason why they're quitting, why they're not occupying, why they're not possessing what it is that God's told them to possess, why it is they're not using the talent that God has given them. Well, I know God gave me this talent, but the, it, the opportunity just never happened. There's always reasons, but there's no excuse. You know, there was a, not, not too many weeks ago, there was a, a young man who went in and shot some people. And when the judge, they had this on, on video, and the judge said, why did you do it? And he said, well, that morning, and he started going through the things that happened that morning. I mean, his, his mother, who he loved, yelled at him and called him some names, kicked him out of the house. When he called his dad, who lived in another city, his dad just cussed him out. He, he got, got with his best friend, and his best friend just was going through something and just kind of blew him off. So he just went home, got a revolver out of his dad's gun cabinet, and went to the place where he went and just shot some people. And the judge said, son, I know that's the reason that you did it, but that's no excuse. And he sentenced him. And we need to understand that. There may be reasons why we don't 
act like a Christian or don't want to act like a Christian or don't want to possess our bodies or we don't want to possess our finances, we don't want to possess, we don't want to possess our life, we don't want to possess our families. There may be reasons because of things that have happened, but when the judge looks at it, even though there may be reasons, there's no excuse. Why is there no excuse? Because Jesus has made a way of escape that whatever temptation, test, or trial you're going through, He will deliver you from it so that you can bear it. And I'm done. (laughs) Hallelujah. Do you receive that today? Father, in the name of Jesus, We give you all the glory. We give you the praise. And we commit to you that we will possess and occupy what you've given us to possess and occupy. In the name of your son Jesus, amen.